Okay. All right. So I think we can start. Uh, so, Philip, thank you very much for the acceptance of our invitation. Uh, so today, guys, we have the honor to receive Dr. Philip Strasberg from Barcelona, but I think he's, uh, he's in California. So, uh, Philip, thank you very much. And uh, you may start whenever you feel ready. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Pedro. Thanks for the introduction. Um, my plan is not to immediately start sharing my slides, just to make it a bit more personal, maybe. <laughs> so the goal of this talk is to discuss some basic concepts of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics and, and quantum thermodynamics. And, and these concepts are Landau's principle, entropy, entropy production, the second law, and Clausius inequality. And, and these things should be fairly basic concepts on which we should all have a broad agreement. But in fact, if you look at the literature, you will see and find a lot of confusing and partially contradictory statements. So the goal of this talk is to make this as, as transparent uh, and consistent as, as possible. So yeah, please feel free to, to interrupt me any time. And we can also stop the talk at any time if it goes too long then, uh, I don't mind. Yes, uh, uh, we still don't see your slides. Yes, I, I'm, 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 I'm sharing okay. them in a minute. Okay. Um, but in fact, before I start sharing my slides, I wanted to get to know my audience a bit better and just ask who of you has heard of Landauer's principle? Could you like raise your arm or I don't know, there's kind of an emotion button or reaction button at the bottom of of Zoom. So, so who has heard of Landauer's principle in the audience? No one? No. One, one person knows Landauer's principle? Two? Three? Four? Okay, so roughly like one third has, has heard of Landauer's principle. Uh, I think okay. a brief review can be welcome for me. I don't know. Yeah, right. Um, okay. So, that, so that's good to know because I will start with Landauer's principle and I will try to explain it well. But you know, if you don't get the full motivation of why people think that's interesting and so on, don't worry because you can easily hop on uh, at the next topic. All right. So let's now try to share my screen. So now you see it full screen, I guess. Um, so just before I start, uh, this was done in collaboration with, with Maria uh, Garcia Diaz and Andreo Vera Company, who are now postdocs somewhere else in Madrid and in, in Innsbruck, and Anna Sapera and Andreas Winter, who are uh, still in Barcelona. And as I promised, I will start directly with Landauer's principle. And if you ask people what it is, you will probably get the following inequality as an answer. And I will try to explain this to you now. So what they will say is that the work needed to erase one bit in the memory is at least KBT log two. So what do you mean by erasing one bit uh, in a memory? So very simply, you could picture a memory as a double well potential where you have a state on the left and the right well and you say this is my logical state zero this is my logical state one okay then you have one bit um and initially you don't know where your bit is so it's a 50 50 channel And if you want to read your memory, find end up with a sign state, you choose one and, and, and fix it. So the question is how much work do we have to spend um, to, to do this kind of uh, transformation? And to make things simple, 
I assume that the state zero and one have the same energy. Okay, so there's no, so you know, this is supposed to be the energy axis here, and they have supposed to have the same energy. And then it turns out that you find that work is the work you need to to do this process is lower bounded by kvt log two. So let's rewrite the statement a little bit. Um, so since the energies are degenerate of these two states, the work done on the system is minus the heat flow from the system that you assume that you have a memory which is immersed in a, in a there's a change in entropy when going from state, right? Um, I, I, I think you have a problem with the internet. Yes. Yeah. Or it's just for me. How inequality should ring a bell? Oh. Yeah, it also, uh, it's not. So uh, the connection is not good. Yeah, the connection is not good. Like, in, not. Can do a order. <laughs> Did giving talks. Can make a different network. Let me see whether this works. Okay. No problem. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you, Philip. Yeah. Um, so if it doesn't work well, the only thing I can do is maybe find another corner in the house where I can better connection. Yeah, it seems much better than than before. So I think you can try again, and if it does I'm not still work, it's the same place. And this is, okay, so let's let's try it. And if, if the problem comes up again, just just tell me. Okay. And I will, go to another corner in the house. Maybe that's, I don't know where the best connection is. Okay. Um, all right. So where was I? I mean, where did I get stuck? So, so you got the explanation of erasing one bit in the memory, right? All right. Yeah, that, that, that's right, yeah. OK, so what I now want to say is I just want to explain the origin of this equation, uh, where this inequality, where it comes from. And what I said is that 
because the energies are degenerate of this system, so there's no change in internal energy here. The work done in the system is minus the heat flux from the environment into the system. And then I use that this term on the right hand side is basically the change in entropy between these two states, right? And then I just reorder this inequality and I get that one. And and this should be, you know, this inequality should ring a bell. I hope you have seen it before as just a standard form of a second law for a system coupled to a heat bus. Or if you like, a clausus inequality, we will come back to that uh, later on. Um, but then you can also ask the question, OK, so this is just you know the standard second law. And I just rewrite this inequality in a, in a very simple way, and I get out Landau's principle. So why do I use a different term for Landau's principle? So if you want to be a bit mean, you could really say, OK, Landau's principle really is the second law. And therefore, it's redundant to use a different word for it for such a simple application of a second law. OK. And I, I think if you read Landauer's paper and, and all the discussion that followed, I think actually Landauer tried to make a bit of a different point. Because there was one subtle step which we did and which people typically take for granted, but which is not at all obvious. And that subtle step was exactly when I went from this inequality to that inequality. So when I told you that KB log two equals a change in, in entropy and in someone like entropy of that memory. Because in order to get this, you have to assume that Chen entropy is a useful notion of thermodynamic entropy, even for a small system out of equilibrium. And that's for sure not a trivial statement, and that's not at all an axiom of thermodynamics, but that's something we really have to put in from statistical mechanics. So I think that the actual message of Landauer's principle is the following, namely that Chen entropy times Boltzmann's constant equals non-equilibrium thermodynamic entropy for a small system in contact with a fast thermal bus and whose states have equal intrinsic entropies. And I've written a book not only about this, but this is one of the points I, I, I try to make clear, because once you accept this, then this inequality I showed you initially follows as a very easy application of the second law. Now, I guess you, you might ask, okay, what is this fast thermal bars? What does equal intrinsic entropy mean? So if you have if you're familiar with open quantum systems theory a little bit, you know, then fast thermal bars basically means that you're weakly coupled to a Markovian uh thermal bars okay so you don't want to have any kind of strong coupling effects uh which which change would, would change the picture what does equal intrinsic entropy mean well i think this becomes clear if i show you the picture again so this is our you know simple sketch of a one bit memory with two double wells and uh, where you can store the two states zero and one but in fact, I could use also this system to store one bit of information where I say when the particle is in the left, I call it zero. If the particle is on the right, I call it one. Okay. You know, you, you could, you know, do the same computations with this system as you did with this system. But but you easily see that the state one is very different from the state zero. And actually, what turns out is that they have really equal and uh, unequal intrinsic entropies. Whereas here in the symmetric case, they have the same intrinsic entropies. So this is something uh, uh, which I mean uh, with that statement. All right. So this was an introduction to Landau's principle. Again, if you didn't completely follow, it's no problem because we will now talk about a more general topic, namely about what is entropy. But if you have any questions, please interrupt me and, and just just ask. Sorry, may I interrupt you? Sure. Uh, let me ask a question. So I, I I don't have my my camera working very well. So now I'm a black uh, screen. Uh, when you say that you are in a double well, you are neglecting 
for instance, uh, entanglement effects, or m more than this, you, you are, uh, nor, uh, sorry, uh, tunneling effects, effects, because you can tunnel from one channel to, to from one, from one side for the other. So this bath is always is a a way to forget about this tunneling effect or not? Yes. So I mean, I mean here I had a pretty classical picture in mind. Simply put it like that, right? The way what Landau also had in mind, and the way how our computers basically work, right? So you just have a bit. And, and you want to have certain stability in your bit. So, I mean, what is a bit? First of all, you need to be able to distinguish between two states, and this is zero and one. And then you want to have a certain stability because you want that your hard disk in your, in your computer saves your nice uh, holiday photos for some time, which means that you have to have a certain high barrier such that, that you can for sure neglect quantum tunneling and that also the probability to spontaneously jump over that in a, in a thermally activated way is quite, quite small. So, so what I showed, I mean, just, you know, think about really a bit in your, in, in your computer uh, and, and, and that's it. And, and this is a very simplified sketch, but, but quantum tunneling was, was completely disregarded here. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good. Um, so now I'd like to talk about entropy. And whenever I say entropy in this talk, I mean entropy in the sense of thermodynamics, not in the sense of information theory. And the question is, you know, I give you a system, I specify some experimental <coughs> setting. Um, what, how should you define thermodynamic entropy of that setting? Okay. Even if the setup is far from equilibrium, even if it's far from the thermodynamic limit and all these kind of things. Um, and I believe that there's a very nice uh, answer, but this answer might turn out to you like to be a bit new. Um, so let me approach the, the, this problem slowly by first of all talking about two widely used um, entropy candidates and why they are not the right answer. So the first entropy candidate that you know for sure is for Neumann entropy. At least I hope you have <laughs> you have seen it, um, which is defined as you know trace row log row with a minus sign, um, and that's used a lot in, in many disciplines because it is very useful, and in particular it has one property, namely that any unitary transformation leaves the phenomenon entropy invariant. But that poses a real problem for statistical mechanics because if you assume that you have an isolated system and you let, just let it evolve according to its Hamiltonian, and you identify for Neumann entropy with thermodynamic entropy, this implies that entropy is always constant. It never increases. And that's, of course, a bit in contradiction to our experience, where you know we know that entropy increases if the gas expands, if two different liquids mix, um, if heat flows from hot to cold, and all these kind of things. And in fact, Van Neumann was completely aware of that problem. And I, I have for you here a nice quote from him. And since you can all read, I, I just want to ask you to take a few seconds to, to read this quote. Okay, I hope you read it and I think it's, it very nicely shows where the problem is, because if you really want to compute rho or this quantity, if you want to know this in an experiment, what do you have to know? Well, you have to know the state rho, right? But now suppose you have a system, well, even if it has only 10 spins, but even for 10 spins to know ready, to such a precision, basically, which is really impossible to do in any experiment. And, and therefore, von Neumann says, well, you know, if you're an observer where you assume that you can measure everything what you want to perfect precision, then you should use von Neumann entropy. But in our world around us, we precisely do statistical mechanics 
because we cannot measure the precise microstate of a many body system. Okay. So that's the second candidate to entropy, um, which really nicely overcomes this problem and which is also very well known. And that's Boltzmann's entropy, right? So that is simply defined as log of a term, which I like to call a volume term. That's why I give it a, a letter V. Sometimes it's also letter W or an omega or whatsoever. And what does this significa, uh, signify? 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 Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so V is the number of microstates compatible with your macrostate, right? So you measure a certain particle density, a certain temperature, whatsoever, and then V is supposed to tell you the number of, of microstates or the volume and phase space which gives rise to this uh, macrostate. Okay, so it's a very simple concept. I, I again assume that you, you know this very well. Now to understand the second law is actually very easy with this with this picture. Um, even if you have a pure state and you you know even without any ensemble averages, and to understand this, I'm showing you here these kind of pictures which uh, Roger Penrose likes to draw. Uh, likes to draw. So this is the phase space of some thermodynamic system. So with many particles, and all these little areas here they belong to certain volume terms, and then. When you do the mass, you will actually find that there's one volume term which is really dominating all the other volume terms. So it's extremely large, and this is a term which corresponds to thermal equilibrium. Whereas all out of equilibrium terms have a very small volume term. And then you easily see that, for instance, if you start out of equilibrium down here in a small cell and phase space, and if you're dynamics you know has no hidden conserve quantities and symmetries then it will just during the evolution start to explore the phase space in a seemingly random way and by definition you will wander from a low entropy region to a higher entropy region and you will stay most of the time in equilibrium which is a maximum entropy state so this really nicely explains everything what is behind um, uh, the second law and again, I, I, I have a quote from you, this time from James, and I ask you to, to also read uh, that one. <clears throat> so you see James, where you would typically think that, you know, he would be a strong advocate of, of von Neumann and Chen entropy. Even he acknowledges the importance of, of, of Boltzmann entropy. So, so sorry, Philip. I, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm still seeing the Penrose figure. Oh. Yeah. Do, do the slides switch now? Uh, not for me, but, but maybe it's, it's, it's just me. I don't know. Okay, then I stop share and share again. <laughs> I'm sorry for all these technical difficulties. So now you see the Penrose figure? Yeah, Penrose figure. And now you see a quote? Uh, not really. Yeah, we see a text. Ah, now I see the quote, yeah, the quote, yeah. Okay, ah, Okay. So, so please read it. Um, I also have a, a question, Philip. Because I mean, I'm a bit confused because uh, for me the the, the Boltzmann entropy also has a problem because if you have a closed system, your dynamics. The Liouville theorem says that the volume preserves the dynamics. No, so the entropy would not change. But how now you're not associating the entropy with the ensemble, but it's with a single trajectory in the phase space. Is that I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, so this, so okay, this volume is very different from the volume that you have in mind, which which enters the Liouville theorem, right? So, so yes. what enters there is the volume of the phase space density, but this is a volume you define with respect to certain macro states, oh, okay. right? So you, you know, think of the standard example of having ga gas particles in a box, and you ask how many particles are in the left half of the box. So this is more kind of the typicality argument, no? That the boat came. 
Yeah, I wouldn't. At most, yeah. It's, it's not yet even typicality in, in some sense, I would say. This is just, you know, a, a simple way of, you know, only certain observables are relevant for, for thermodynamics, right? And, and this just partitions the phase space according to that observable in terms of macrostates. And, and this is just the picture you get out of it. And, and, and then you could say typicality, yeah. Typically, if you pick a state at random, you will end up in thermal equilibrium. So, I mean, when I look at the macro state, most of the micro states look the same, no? They are typical in this sense. No? That's it. Um, yes. Yeah, you can view it like that, yeah. I mean, I think there's a subtle difference, but, but maybe let's discuss this afterwards as well. Okay, good. So now you saw phenomenal entropy, which has a problem. You saw Boltzmann entropy, which seems to work well for macroscopic systems. But just previously, when I talked about Landau's principle, I told you that its main insight is that for a small open system, Shen entropy is a good candidate for thermal entropy. So, so now again, you have kind of a contradiction and you say, okay, but how do I apply Boltzmann entropy to a small microstate where the volume is equal to one, so the log of it is zero. And, and that brings me to my third answer, which basically combines these two concepts of von Neumann and, and, and Boltzmann entropy. And I really think that's the answer for the 21st century and I call it observational entropy. So here's a definition, but actually to, to, to understand the terms here, we have to talk about a very important concept, which is what I call a coarse graining X. What is a coarse graining? Well, you have your big system with some Hilbert space, but as I said, we cannot look at it with complete precision, you cannot ha have knowledge of, of its microstate. But if we look at a certain observable with a certain precision, and you can describe this by a complete set of projectors, which I call a cost graining X. Okay. And what kind of cost grainings you have to choose, I will talk about later on. But by now, it's just any set of projectors. And then we all know that, you know, quantum mechanics tells you that the probability to be in one of those states x is a trace of, of the projector times your state rho. And you can actually define a volume term as a trace of this projector. So this projector is rank one, this is one, but typically a coarse observable uh, will imply that your volume terms are much larger than one. And then observational entropy, you see it's kind of a combination of Shen entropy with respect to your measurement plus an average Boltzmann entropy. And depending on how large your system is and how fine your cost graining is, one term can dominate the other. In particular, you can show that if you assume that you can really measure perfectly in the eigenbasis of your density operator, this reduces to von Neumann entropy. But in general, it, it does not. Uh, because you don't have perfect knowledge, okay? So this will be my, my notion of entropy for this talk. I hope I can convince you this is a good notion. Um, I must admit that this is not due to me, but in fact, it was von Neumann who, who wrote this down first for quantum systems. Uh, although in a footnote, he said he, he got this inspiration from Wigner, but, but Wigner is not an author of this paper. And you will find it in the number of stat mag texts, for instance, on CompMap has used it and a few others. But if I would make a poll, I guess most of you haven't seen that so far. So it's really not used so much. Uh, you can find it here and there, but it's not a common uh, form of entropy. And I, I got to know it actually from a recent paper from some guys here from California and Santa Cruz where, where I am. We really said, okay, that's a good uh, definition for thermodynamic entropy, even for an isolated 
quantum system out of equilibrium. Okay. Good. So that's our candidate for entropy. Uh, is there any question about entropy? Um, about what I was showing you? If, if not, I come to a second, a uh, third important concept, which is entropy reduction. Um, so what is entropy reduction? Well, let me first of all tell you one very common answer, uh, which you find in, 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 in many papers and which reflects part of the truth, but is at the end not satisfactory. And that's a very popular answer that you find. Um, so let me explain it to you. So again, you know, I have the mindset where we consider a small open system coupled to a bath. That system is characterized by certain states, which are labeled 0, 1, and 2. And if you would monitor the system, you would see that it randomly jumps between these states at random times due to the fact that it's coupled to a heat bath. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, Philip. Actually, we have a question. Yes. Uh, Nor Norton asked in the chat how to interpret that trace on the set of projectors. Well, this is really, I mean, actually, this is really what is sketched here. So, what is this volume term microscopically in a Hilbert space? Well, you have to divide your Hilbert space into your observable macro states, and you have to somehow measure the size of each macro state. And classically, you would say I have a phase space and I really have a volume integral over certain regions in phase space. And quantum mechanically, you have a Hilbert space, and this is really then the dimension of a sub Hilbert space. And the dimension of a sub Hilbert space of all the states which give rise to outcome X is just the trace of this projector. And, and, and that's it. Okay, so if there's any other question, ask again. If not, I just continue here. Okay. So I was trying, yeah. Was there a question? No, no, actually, uh, Norton, do you have another question? You may uh, write in the chat and I, I read him if your microphone is not working. Ah, okay. Okay. Okay, no questions. Um, so I Okay, cool. So, so I draw this picture of an open system in contact with a bath, which has a random stochastic trajectory, right? And a trajectory I labeled with gamma, and gamma dagger is for me the notation for the time reverse trajectory, so where you start here at the end and go back to the path, basically. Then P of gamma is the probability to observe such a trajectory, and P with a subscript TR is the probability to observe this time reverse trajectory in a time reverse experiment where you might have to flip a magnetic field or something like that. Okay. And then you will see in many works um, that people say, okay, entropy production is the relative entropy between this probability and that probability. Okay. And, and in fact, Often for Markov processes, you can write it like this and even in more general terms, but there's something which is fundamentally uh, unsatisfactory about this definition. So I, I hope you know what relative entropy is. It's just you know, a concept where you can define the distance, basically the statistical distance between two probability distribution. And relative entropy has two important properties. First of all, it's always non-negative and it's asymmetric in its arguments. So when you say this is entropy production, you basically start by definition with a positive and time asymmetric quantity. But actually, if you come from a microscopic perspective, that's something you want to show and not what you want to postulate, right? So that's the goal of statistical mechanics to show that there's an error of time. And therefore, this cannot be the, the right answer in general. And the very simple answer actually is what is entropy production is just to say, well, it's a change in entropy of the universe. Now, what kind of entropy do I use? Well, I use observational entropy, which I introduced two slides ago. Second question, what is the universe? Well, that's a bit subtle. 
but basically you should think of the universe as all the relevant subsystems which play a role during the time scale of the experiment. So this could be the system, including the bars. It could be a set of ultra cold atoms which are well isolated from the rest of the world, or it could be the universe of the entire cosmos, right? Uh, so let's try to stick to this question. Uh, let's try to, try to stick to the definition. Let's see what we can do with that. What's the second law? Well, the second law is very easy. It just tells you that this should be non-negative, okay? Entropy should be produced during most processes, or it can stay constant, but it should not decrease. And that's maybe the second law. If you have seen it in a couple of, of textbooks, I hope so. And the question is, what can we show mathematically now? What kind of rigorous theorems or statements are known when we use observational entropy? And I hope that this also convinces you about the fact that observational entropy is a really good candidate to look at entropy um, in, 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 in thermodynamics or in, or in statistical mechanics. And there's first one very important theorem called the H theorem by von Neumann. Again, uh, I, I want to give you uh, some time to, to read it on your own. Okay, so I, I hope you read it and, and could see it at this time. So I think that's a really remarkable theorem, which actually was long forgotten in the literature and now people are reviving it. And um, to understand it, if you don't have a background in, in isolated many body physics, I, I want to explain three, three technical words. So first of all, you consider non-integrable models. And precisely what this means is that von Neumann assumes that if you look at the set of all energy differences in your system, right? So all kinds of transition frequencies, then all those should be non-degenerate, okay? So it's not that your system energies are non-degenerate, but it's that your transition frequencies are non-degenerate, okay? Then what is a sufficiently coarse coarse graining? Well, uh, sorry, Philip. Uh, yes. How general is this assumption? Uh, that I you're mean, non-integrable? Yeah, if I pick up a random system, how general is the assumption uh, <clears throat> about the, 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 the generalities of the eigen energy distributions? Yeah, I think it's pretty generic in a sense that if you if you pick a, an integrable system and add a small random perturbation to it, then it will satisfy that. Oh, okay. okay. Um, up to really accidental degeneracies, which are very small in number, which you could actually take into account and, and refine it, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty generic, I would say. Um, yes, so what does it mean to have a coarse coarse graining? Well, statistical mechanics works well because we cannot observe with, with perfect accuracy what is going on. And, and what von Neumann basically assumes is that the, the number of measurement results that you can distinguish, so the number of these different small x, um, that number should be much smaller than the dimension of the Hilbert space. And since the dimension of the Hilbert space scales exponentially with the particle number, this is really satisfied in, in, in all experiments which we have so far in, in in thermodynamics or statistical mechanics. And finally, he uses that this coarse screening has no special orientation. So mathematically, this means that if you look at the eigenbasis of X and compared with the eigenbasis of your system Hamiltonian, then they are basically related by a random unitary transformation. And he averages over these random transformations. So really likes to exclude kind of non-generic cases where you look at a very special observable, which is really fine-tuned with your system to give rise to kind of non thermodynamic behavior. But once you satisfy these things, you can really show that for all initial states, 
even pure states, if you evolve them in time, then you will end up at the maximum value and spend most time there. And I'm not going to prove the theorem for you, but I just show you some, you know, numerical proof, if you like, where these people actually here in California, they look at a simple system where we have a one-dimensional chain of electrons. They can hop on these chains and they define a coarse graining by looking at how many particles do you have here on the left and here in this region and in that region and that region. And they define observation entropy for that coarse graining. And then they start with all the particles here on the left. And you see if you plot observation entropy that it quickly grows, then oscillates a little bit and then stays really close to this green line. And this green line is the maximum value of this uh, entropy. That's kind of demonstrating what, what von Neumann had in mind. Uh, so if you start with a low entropy con uh, condition, it's very likely that you go up in entropy, then you end up uh, at the maximum entropy for, for most times. Okay. However, you cannot prove that sometimes you might be able to pick a state where you actually initially fluctuate downwards in entropy. So you temporarily violate the second law and only at late times you, you go up in entropy. And also there are a couple of you know, assumptions about this uh, system Hamiltonian that also should not be time dependent and these kind of things. So I want to show you kind of a different version of the second law, which overcomes these problems, but then has, has other problems. And I call it non-equilibrium second law. And, and the setting is the following. Now, I assume that my initial state is of this form. So if you look at it closely, and if you assume, you know, you have your Hilbert space, Subspaces, something like macros, uh, defined for your different coarse graining, coarse grain states X. So you assume that you have, you find a system with equal probability in each microstate given a certain uh, X. And then you just convex combine them with an arbitrary probability, probability distribution P of X, okay? So that's basically the state. If you know your measurement result, that's the maximum entropy state actually for your configuration. Now what you can then show, and you know, this is a very strong assumption compared to the assumption before, which works for all pure initial states. But on the other hand, now what you can show for every Hamiltonian, even if it's time dependent, where lambda subscript T is some time dependent control field here, you can show that observation entropy always increases if you start from a state like that. Okay. In particular, if you assume that your coarse graining is a coarse grain uh, measurement of energy, then it means that this rho zero term, you can write it like this, where omega E really is a standard microcanonical ensemble, which you know from equilibrium statistical mechanics. So if you start with such a state and you look at energy as a coarse graining, you will find that entropy always increases uh, for, for any Hamiltonian, any driving. And you can find a proof of this in, in a paper I have written. Uh, it's a tutorial paper, so it also contains a lot of references because this inequality was known before, I think even already to, to Gibbs uh, in, in the classical form. All right. So these are two versions of, of a second law, which you can prove just based on, on observational entropy. One was in a setting where you have pure states and a non-integrable model. The other one was where you start with an ensemble of states, but have any kind of dynamics. And, and the final question of this talk is, how, how is this related to Clausius uh, inequality? But maybe we have questions um, uh, at the moment, I, I don't know. I, mean, I have a question. So in yes. this case that you prove that the entropy always increases, it doesn't matter the, the, the size of the system because I would expect that if the system is small, there is no problem if the entropy decays at some point. No, it just have to become more rare and rare. <clears throat> as you 
concrete assisted size, no? Yeah, so this is certainly a feature of, of, of that theorem, right? So if you would have a very small system, you would see a lot of oscillations. And then this is no longer true. Um, simply because the core spinning is no longer coarse, right? Your, your number of states that you measure or that you can distinguish in a measurement becomes comparable to the Hilbert space dimension. Um, this theorem continues to be true. This is just a mathematical fact whenever you start from such a state. But if you would plot this, it could still happen this, that this oscillates a lot. So that's, com so that's completely compatible with what you say, yes. Okay, the difference is still oscillates. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, if you, if you plot this, you, you can really see oscillations for small systems. You're just guaranteed that when you start from the state, you never, you know, you can never oscillate further downwards than your initial entropy. Ah, okay, okay, so. Yeah, so it's basically in this plot, you start here and you might have big oscillations for small systems, but you never go down the initial value, below the initial value. Oh, okay. Philip. Yes. Uh, can we link this with uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis? So <clears throat> there's a paper by Marcos Rigol and Mark Sobinski who claim that the assumptions that von Neumann do are essentially equivalent to the assumptions of the ETH. So both would be the same thing? They claim that. So basically, von Neumann invented the ETH in some sense. Hmm. Now you can read the paper. It's a PL. I think it's a nice paper. I, so it is a nice paper, but I'm not sure how well it is accepted that no. these things are really equivalent to the ETH. Which, which, which paper is this? It's a PIL from 2012. I think it's called Alternatives to the Eigenstate Thermalization Hypothesis. Ah, OK. And so, so certainly, if you assume ETH, um, you, you, you can prove for Norman's H theorem. And, but, but he proves it in a different way. So I think the question how far these things are really equivalent is, is very subtle. But you're right that these things are closely connected. Yes. Okay, so in the final part, I'd like to talk about Clausius inequality, a very well-known result, I would say. So the question is, what is Clausius inequality? Well, I already showed you that. You have a system in contact with a heat bath and it can exchange temperature with it. So most people would say this is Clausius inequality, but in fact, that's not entirely true. Because if you look at Clausius paper, he writes down this expression, okay? And I hope you have also seen that from many textbooks in, in, in thermodynamics. Um, so what is the difference? Well, here you have an integral over time where you divide the heat flux by the instantaneous temperature of the bath, and that temperature can be time dependent. That's an important point. So you easily see if your bath is so large that its temperature basically does not change and stays constant, you're back to that inequality. That's an implication of Clausius inequality. But when you start from here, it's clear that you cannot get to that inequality where Clausius was fully aware of that a system or a bath can change its temperature when it's coupled to another system and can exchange heat, all right? Again, however, if you look at the contemporary literature and quantum thermodynamics, you will really find nowhere the statement, whereas everybody will write down this and say, oh, this is uh, Clausius inequality. And, and the question is, why is it so popular? I think that's an interesting question for the history of science why people in quantum thermodynamics forgot about that more general version. But one reason for its popularity is because it's very easy to derive this inequality <clears throat> by doing the following. So assume you have an initial system bar state, which has this form. So where you have an arbitrary system state initially decorrelated from a Gibbs state of a bar, 
then you can show the following identity. You can show that KB times the change in phenomenon entropy of the system plus the change in expectation value of the bar Hamiltonian divided by the temperature T, which is fixed by this beta, is equal to this quantum relative entropy. But this is a full time evolved state, and this is the time evolved system states tensor the Gibbs state of a bath. <clears throat> and now you recognize three things. First of all, relative entropy, also the quantum relative entropy, is always non negative. So that's larger than zero. And you say, oh, wow, okay, let's interpret this as a system entropy. And the change in bath energy, this is minus the heat flux into the system. So then you immediately end up with that statement. And, and really proving this, you can really do it at home. It's, it's a couple of lines. It's very easy to do. However, by, no, but by now, I hope I was able to convince you that you should take this derivation with a grain of salt and should be a bit more skeptical about it. For the following reason. So first of all, by definition, relative entropy is positive. So you already start with a positive quantity. So what you want to show, you actually put in by hand. Moreover, the question whether this is really equal to entropy of your system depends a little bit on your system. Because we said that for a small system, this is probably true, where you can really measure perfectly and distinguish the microstates. But if your system has, say, a thousand spins, phenomenal entropy is no longer a good measure of thermodynamic entropy. And finally, you see that you immediately get this expression, and you get this without further assumption. So this is true for any Hamiltonian. But as I just told you, you know, if you start from this expression, you cannot get back to this expression. Right? So basically, what you show here is something which is actually too strong. You're showing more that you want. You, you show this nice mathematical inequality, but you can link it to the second law only if your bath is really large and stays close to its uh, equilibrium state. So the question is, can we derive this inequality microscopically? And yes, we can under the same assumptions as spelled out here if we use observational entropy. So how does it work? That's a sketch of a system an open system coupled to a heat bath. So I assume the open system is relatively small, like a qubit, and you can really measure perfectly arbitrary rank one projectors. So you could measure zero or one in the z direction or in the x or y direction, whatever you like. The bath, however, is typically a larger object, and you don't have perfect knowledge about it. But I assume that you can measure its energy in a coarse grain way. So this is try to sketch here. Um, so, you know, here you have the different energy levels of the bars, and I assume you can measure it up to precision delta. Um, and this gives rise to these coarse grain energy windows. Yeah. Okay. And now you can actually show something very nicely. So. I start with the same condition as before, an arbitrary system state decorrelated from a Gibbs state at an initial temperature beta zero for the bars. And you can overcome these assumptions, but things are very nice if you, if you start from this assumption. And then you can really show a chain of inequalities where each line upper bounds the previous one. So you can first of all show its observation entropy of this total system of the entire universe is non-negative. You can show that the changes of the local entropies are also non-negative and upper bound this term. And in particular, if you assume that you can measure your system perfectly because it's very small, recall that observational entropy for the system reduces to for Neumann entropy. So that's really the phenomenon entropy of a system. Then you can show that this term is upper bounded by this kind of Claudius expression, where the heat flux is just really the flow of energy into the system. And this temperature T is microscopically defined, even for non-equilibrium states. And I will show you the definition on the next slide. <clears throat> and you can show that this is 
upper bounded by this term, which brings us back then to that inequality. And, and you really nicely see that, that this inequality really emerges by, by, by really throwing away more and more information and by really basically neglecting the fact that you have a bath which is finite and assuming it's basically infinite. Okay, then, then you get that term out. And I think that's really a novel result, and this was derived here in, in, in these papers. Um, and I think this really gives a really transparent look on the second law for open quantum systems, which is really a new nice on what, what people like Boltzmann and Van Neumann and so on did for isolated systems by showing that when and how does entropy increase in isolated systems. And here you apply this to the system and the bars, find a hierarchy of second laws where the clause inequality, which nobody could really derive previously, is really contained as, as one member of that hierarchy. Okay, so finally, that's the final slide um, before I conclude. Um, we have to fix, or we have to think about what is the temperature? How do you define this? Because that's really a non-equilibrium temperature. And that's defined in the following way. And this really works for any state row. So you look at the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, so the energy in, as I said, any state row, even if it's not out of equilibrium, and you ask, is there a Gibbs state which has the same or which has the same internal energy. Um, so you ask, okay, which temperature do I have to choose for an equilibrium state such that its energy corresponds to the energy of a non-equilibrium state? And in fact, you can show that this is a, always a solution for beta and you really uniquely determines uh, uh, beta. And that concept of temperature, you know, it was, used here and there in a couple of works. I think it actually appears first of all in, in this paper. But if you look at this paper, you will not find this, this, uh, this equality because that was a paper written really in spirit of phenological thermodynamics without any statistical mechanics. But it's interesting because you can come up with really an alternative operational interpretation of this equality. And that's the following. So assume you have a system it might be in a non-equilibrium state, and you want to determine what is its effective temperature. How can you do that? Well, you can assume that you have a, you know, in your experiment, you can prepare a big super bath, so a really large thermal object at a given temperature T, and you can put it in contact with your non-equilibrium system. And then you ask the following question: How do I have to choose the temperature of the super bath? such that when I put the system in contact with the super bath, there is no net heat exchange between these two systems. And this you can measure in principle. And if you find that there's no net heat exchange, it actually implies that the temperature of the super bars is equal to this non-equilibrium temperature. <clears throat> and statistical mechanics tells you that this is the right um, equality for that. Okay, so let me just go back. That's the temperature which enters here. And this does not assume that the bath is a Gibbs state at these times. In general, the bath will be a non-equilibrium state, but you can still define a useful notion of temperature for non-equilibrium state by appealing to this equality um, here. All right, so I think I'm already over my time, but we already had a couple of questions and, and technical difficulties. So I skipped the last part where I was talking about, um, or where I would talk about how you can really efficiently compute all these things using a master equation approach, which is a modified master equation and takes into account information about the energy of the bars, which you typically disregard and trace out. But I will skip that. Um, and I just come to the conclusions. And the conclusions have two slides. <clears throat> so first of all, I wanted to just put up an experiment for you, which, which I found always inspiring when I thought about these problems, and which really shows that 
experimentally, we have already, you know, reached uh, a time where we really have to think about finite size effects in the bars. What is happening here? So, so this experiment is done in the Estinger group in Zurich. So they have two clouds of ultra cold atoms. Um, and in total, that's a really well isolated system. So it doesn't interact with the outside world. And they can prepare one of the clouds at a higher temperature. And they can connect these two clouds by a narrow transport channel. And then they start to exchange particles. And then what happens, well, the nice thing is what happens is that really the things happen as you expect them from statistical mechanics or thermodynamics. So you start with a temperature difference, then particles start to move between these two clouds, they reduce the temperature difference, but at the same time, and you start with the same particle number, this increases the particle number imbalance. So you create a difference in chemical potential, but then again, this will relax back and you know, has some kind of small oscillation, but in the long time limit, more or less, you end up with the same temperature and the same chemical potential on, on both sides of the bars. And that's just what you expect from equilibrium thermodynamics. And I hope I could convince you that it, you know that is one version of the second law that you could use to describe this uh, setting. We have the heat flux from the hot and the cold bars divided by time dependent temperatures of the hot and the cold bars. I hope you now know how to derive it under which conditions it's you know justified to call it a second law, how it's related to changes in entropy and all and all that. So with this maybe nice picture of an experiment having it in your mind, uh, let me conclude by the five main messages of this talk. So first of all, <clears throat> uh, I said that really Landauer's principle means that thermodynamic entropy can be identified as Shen entropy under certain conditions, namely for small weakly coupled systems. In general, however, thermodynamic entropy should be identified with observational entropy, which reduces in the right limit to, to Landauer's principle, but is more generic. And again, let me stress, I mean, I think I've added some appeal to it, why this is a good notion, but um, this was really introduced before. This was not my idea. However, I tried to emphasize that entropy reduction is really the change in entropy of the universe. Again, that's nothing new, but I think it got a bit lost in our the recent quantum thermodynamics literature and that the second law really states that the change in entropy is non-negative and finally cloud inequality is really a consequence of a second law and it reads in general like that where very importantly you have a time dependent temperature and this kind of integral which really gives a consistent treatment for finite bars and only in the infinite bars limit it really reduces to that what people have previously regarded as Claude's inequality in quantum thermodynamics. That's a very biased <laughs> reading list, but I but I highlight this reference here because that's a tutorial article which contain which contains also a couple of new results, but it also contains references to 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 all these works and 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 tries to really describe things in a pedagogical way. So if you have questions and want to learn more, I think that's a good way to start, and I hope you enjoy reading it and. I definitely welcome any feedback on it and also any feedback um, on this talk. So, so thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip. Okay, so do we have questions? Uh, I, I have one actually. Uh, Philip, th thanks very much, man, for the talk. Uh, regarding the definition of the non equilibrium temperature, Yes. Uh, how, how can we guarantee that that is for every for every state of the system that is only one positive number? Oh, that we can associate for the with, with the temperature. It turns out that it's not necessarily always positive. You can get negative ah, temperatures. Okay. But if you include negative temperatures, you can show that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between energy and temperature. Which makes sense, I think. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you include everything. 
Yeah. Uh, but then, what's the what's the meaning of this guy, physically speaking? I mean, is is this related with the with some sort of derivative of the the, the entropy? Oh, that's a good question. With respect to the energy, actually. Yes. So that is one of the standard definitions of of temperature, of course. <clears throat> but here, I mean, I'm talking about defining temperature for an all of equilibrium state. Mm. And in fact, I'm not even close to equilibrium. I want to really define it for any state. And, and then it's in general a very good question, what is temperature actually? Yeah, Because I mean, all, all the definitions which coincide at equilibrium might give different results out of equilibrium. So what I can tell you is that this temperature definition is really the one which shows up in the derivation of Clausius inequality and makes this term overall positive. But I don't want to claim, and it's good that you asked to clarify this, that this is the only meaningful definition of temperature you can have out of equilibrium. You know, out of equilibrium, things are much richer and you might need multiple temperatures. Um, I can only say that this has certain desirable, pro desirable properties and it's the one which, which shows up in this derivation. And, and yes, in equilibrium for macroscopic system, that definition will basically coincide up to small corrections oh, yeah. with the derivative of entropy with respect to energy. But for an arbitrary system, these things can be completely different. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking about physics. The, the physical meaning of these things, because the way the way you understand the temperature is that um, it's just uh, the kinetic energy per degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I cannot see these here. But okay, it's it's completely out of equilibrium, so it's it's hard to think about these things. Now. <clears throat> I mean, also. Uh... Sorry for interrupt, Lucas, because I mean, oh, I, think also, I mean, I always also like to think of temperature as the mean kinetic energy. But I think if you go to some system that are more complex than the ideal gas, you don't get this correspondence anymore. No, you can, you have also these other degrees of freedom. If you don't have like this, uh, the, the, uh, if your Hamiltonian is not quadratic anymore, then the energy is not mean divided between all degrees of freedom. So I think it's, I don't know how how, much, how far we can push this understanding of temperature as the mean connect energy. This is a, more a question I have than, I mean, because it's something that I always, I mean, I always ask myself. I'm thinking here an infinite dimensional system. I mean, a system with infinite, infinite number of degrees of freedom. Yeah. So temperature should be always positive and because there, there is no way for that thing that they do in uh, um, inverting population or something like this. <clears throat> There's no way to do this. So for a gas, you would typically say that, you know, interactions doesn't matter too much. And then it's true that temperature is related to kinetic energy. Um, I mean, here in this formalism, I don't assume anything about the nature of the system or what the bar is, whether it's okay. gas or phonons or electrons or spins. So I need a more general definition. And the way the way I interpret this a little bit is, you know, you have, so we have this setup, the exchange energy, you might drive your system, whatever. So you kick your, your bars out of equilibrium. It's no longer in a Gibbs state. But now let's assume we, we stop the driving and we just let things evolve on its own. And then at least if the bus is non-integrable and if you believe in, in things like typicality and the ETH, and if you would then say, okay, but the bus is still a big extended object, but I look locally at a small fraction of the bus, right? What, what will be its state? And then you will actually see that Locally, the bars will look as a reduced state of the skip state. That's basically what this equilibration and summarization results in isolated systems tell you that 
your big many body system is just a pure wave function, some psi, which might be far away from equilibrium. But if I look locally on a small subpart, it looks like a reduced state of a Gibbs state. And actually the temperature you have to choose, which is the right one is, is given by, by that one, because that's the temperature which really corresponds to that energy. Um, okay, so we can, uh, we, we can think about it as a local temperature. You can <clears throat> think about as a local temperature, yeah, at least on a certain, certain assumptions. But I mean, these are very subtle questions that you ask, and I'm, I, I don't have a full answer to that because, you know, equilibrium stuff is very rich and, yeah. yeah, and I have to repeat that this is not the only meaningful temperature notion you could cook up to look at your non-equilibrium state. Okay, thanks. Okay, more questions? I mean, I, I also think I have a question like, so if you go to the this paper of von Neumann, I don't, I mean, this paper is like so many information that is impossible to remember everything. But I mean, you, when you show this kind of equilibration results that you can show that most of the initial state, they equilibrate. As far as remember, they never, they know, they not always go, go to the usual canonical ensemble, no? Then you have to put ETH to get that you have equilibration and thermalization, no? And so if I understand correctly uh, what you're trying to say, that if I use this other kind of notion of entropy, then I could also call these other equilibrium states, thermal states in the sense that they maximize the entropy, no? Is that correct? Uh, okay, so now you said many things. <laughs> Let me say. Okay, so first of all, yeah, the paper for Norman is quite long, but I think it's very remarkable. And, you know, this shows you previously, 80 years ago, people were writing long and important papers, and now we write a lot of <laughs> small and unimportant papers. Uh, so it, it's really worth reading it, although it's very technical, but there has been an English translation of it um, recently, like from 10 years ago. Yes. Then, first of all, you said he showed that for most states, this happens. I'm very importantly, he showed that for all states. Okay, that's oh, a very yeah. important difference. He's not showing it for most, he's showing it for all states. Um, um, and then you, you said, okay, the equilibrium state which you get out here is not a thermal canonical state, and that's true. So the equilibrium state you get out here is the state which maximizes observation entropy which is really the state you would expect when you apply the equal a priori probability postulate to this coarse graining. And this does not need to be a canonical state, right? Because a canonical state is, comes out for a specific situation where you have a weakly coupled system to a bath. <laughs> if you do that, if you assume this describes a weakly coupled system to a bath, basically as I had it over here, then you will get out the right thermal state and the right canonical state. Um, but in general, not. I mean, canonical states are just a subset of relevant equilibrium states. Um, okay. Now, okay, did I, ask, did I answer all your question? No, probably not, right? I, think, I mean, I, I think the point is this, no? That, I mean, there are more, much more general equilibrium states, no? I mean, oh, right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. I mean, if, yeah, you, I if you look at another observable, like, again, you have a gas of particles and you ask how many particles are on the left side of the box. Um, then at equilibrium, this has a certain distribution, but that's not a canonical state. It's just... But it's the one which follows from, you know, you take a microcanonical ensemble and then you apply this coarse graining and, and compute the probabilities. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I ask him because I think they're like, so these results of online, my as you're saying, no, I mean, they have been rediscovered. No, Popesco wrote this paper in Nature by the, the Integral Foundation of Statistical Mechanics. Then there are a lot of bunch of papers even by level of it, so typicality of microcanonical. Then there is all these results about 
uh, dynamics of, uh, I mean, proving that you have equilibration and closed isolated systems and everything was there. But my sense is that, I mean, some people claim that you still need ATH to, to, to get this result and Rio uh, and from then uh, to, I mean, to understand equilibration <coughs> or thermalization. No, you still need ATH. And it seems like, at least in, in one of the papers of Peter Ryman, he claims that, I mean, this is the real equilibrium state. Doesn't matter if it's canonical or not, but this is the real equilibrium state. So I think he has this strong claim in this paper. And so it seems there is no completely agreement, I think, between these guys. So that's, an, I mean, that's what the, my question was aiming at. I mean, what's the right. take on it? Yeah. yeah. No, I think this is a big question somewhat unsettled, but in principle also people <clears throat> distinguish the notion of equilibration and thermalization because equilibration I typically say it's a state which just becomes time independent by whatever its distribution yeah, yeah. is. And they use thermalization specifically to say, okay, this is a state you would also expect from applying the equal a priori probability postulate, which is somewhat even stronger because it has to equilibrate and then has to have the right statistics like canonical, microcanonical, or, or yeah. whatever is appropriate, right? Um, and indeed, it often people, I mean, well, it means often, but you know, there are some works showing equilibration, but they cannot show thermalization, but they could if they would assume the ETH on top. Yes. But then ETH is not the only way to show thermalization. You also have other notions and so it's a huge field. Um, I mean, I personally think that the ETH is a very good hypothesis, um, which, which explains a lot in a satisfactory way. Um, but many people might not agree to that. I don't know. No, I mean, I don't have a, also, I mean, a very strong opinion on that. I mean, I think it's it's a good hypothesis, but I mean, just, and as you said, I mean, maybe there are other, I mean, sure, there are other ways to get the canonical symbol besides the ATH. And I mean, and maybe even when you don't have ATH, you could still have a kind of equilibrium. No? And that's in the sense that you are maximizing your uh, thermodynamic entropy. No? This is what I call equilibrium. I mean, Yes. <clears throat> I mean, if you look, for instance, this nature physics paper of Sandro Popescu, Short, and Andres Winter, where there's this typicality result, you know, this does not assume ETH. And in fact, you can show this without assuming anything about the Hamiltonian. And in fact, it's a little bit too strong because this result really tells you, oh, almost everything should look like thermal equilibrium. But obviously, you know, the reason why we can talk now via Zoom is precisely because we are not in equilibrium, right? <laughs> so, so, I mean, the result, of course, is mathematically formally correct, but the question is whether it's really physically justified to assume this R random averages over, over the entire Hilbert space. Sure. And, and, and nature seems yeah. to be a bit more complex and I mean, luckily, otherwise it would be just an equilibrium. And I think the ETH gives a better explanation in the sense that it has a bit more complexity and really has a mechanism to explain how you thermalize an equilibrium if you start out of equilibrium, but does not automatically assume that basically, oh, everything what you do looks always like equilibrium, which is not true, which is a bit too strong. I mean, having said this, the typicality argument is still very nice and important to understand many things. Um, but taken literally, I think it's it's too strong to be true. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Do we have more questions? Okay. No questions on YouTube. I mean, I could be there whole afternoon discussing this, but I'll take a look at the paper and you mentioned, and then maybe yeah, me too. I yeah, come back with more concrete questions. Yeah, yeah. Any feedback is welcome. Yeah. Any questions as well? 
Okay, so I think we don't have questions on YouTube. Okay, so, okay. Uh, Philip, I want to thank you again for the acceptance. And thank you. So thank you very much. It was quite interesting. And uh, okay, we have another talk in two weeks. And thank you very much. So that's it. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot to you. Uh, get well soon, Lucas. I hope you. Well, yeah, me, me too, man. Uh, by the way, I'm getting in touch with you next week. Man. Sorry? I'll get in touch with you next week. Okay. Yeah, we, cool. we have things to finish. Yes, that's right. Yeah. All right. So then, thanks for the invitation. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very question. much. Man. Thank you very much.